Welcome to the Candidate Forum for the 9th Congressional District with the Honorable Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and Candidate Sargi Sangiri. My name is Naveen Kanji and I am the MC for today's event. I am a pediatric resident physician and I grew up in the 9th District. Today's program is proudly being presented to you by the Ismaili Jamatkana and Center. Through the guidance of His Highness the Aga Khan, the 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims, the Ismaili Jamatkanas in the United States are more than places of worship and spiritual search. They are places of friendship, dialogue, inclusivity, and reaching out to neighbors to facilitate an exchange of ideas. This is achieved through hosting cultural programs such as educational seminars and lectures, art exhibitions, music and dance, and as a forum for civic leaders and others. At the opening ceremony of the new headquarters of the Global Center for Pluralism on May 16th, 2017, the Aga Khan explained, and I quote, pluralism does not mean the elimination of difference but the embrace of difference. Genuine pluralism understands that diversity does not weaken a society, it strengthens it. In an ever shrinking, ever more diverse world, a genuine sense of pluralism is the indispensable foundation for human peace and progress." End quote. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement and collaboration on the issues of concern as well as broadening intellectual horizons and fostering an appreciation of pluralism. Today is no exception. Today's session will be moderated by Sean Lewis. Sean Lewis has served as an anchor and reporter at WGN-TV since 2008. He's been a resident of Illinois' 9th Congressional District since 2007. Without further ado, please enjoy the program. Naveen, thank you so much. First, we would like to welcome our candidates, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of the 9th District and Lieutenant Colonel Retired Sargis Sangeri uh, of the 9th District. First, we will tell you a little bit about the candidates. Jan Schakowsky has been a lifelong champion for working and middle-class families. She began her advocacy as a young housewife, leading a successful campaign to require expiration dates on food products, including baby food and formula. She's built her career uh, working for women's rights, comprehensive immigration reform, and getting dangerous weapons of war off our streets. Congresswoman Schakowsky also co-chairs the Democratic Seniors Task Force, which focuses on addressing the needs of older Americans. Congresswoman Schakowsky was first elected to Congress in 1998. Our second candidate today, Republican Sargis Sangari a retired Lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. Army, having served our country for more than 20 years in the Army Infantry and Special Forces. Lieutenant Colonel Sangari served multiple deployments to Iraq, where he survived seven IED explosive attacks and was awarded the Combat Action Badge. The Lieutenant Colonel is an Assyrian Christian and immigrated to the United States from Iran. On September 11, 2014, he founded the Near East Center for Strategic Engagement, of which he serves currently as CEO. The center is an academic and operational policy studies, research institution, and think tank that provides political, military analyses, and assessments of Middle Eastern affairs. Today's questions are being asked today and prepared in advance by the Ismaili Jamakana and Center Planning Committee. The rules for today's forum call for civility on both parts of the candidates. The hallmark, of course, of democracy is the willingness of our community to treat each other with courtesy and respect. It is in that spirit that we are here today, engaged in a vital part of our democratic process, civilized discussion of the important issues that confront our communities today. We will begin today with opening remarks. Each candidate will receive two minutes to speak. This will be followed by a question and answer session. I will ask the question and each candidate will have two minutes of uninterrupted time to respond to the question. Questions will be asked in alternating order. After the question and answer session, each candidate will have two minutes to make closing remarks before we conclude the forum. 
And with that, uh, we welcome the Congresswoman and Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Opening statements, we will start with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Well, thank you so very much. I am thrilled to be able to, for a long time now, represent one of the most diverse districts in our country and in our city. People from all over the globe come to the 9th Congressional District. There's lots of services and a welcoming attitude. Um, we have every race and religion represented here. Um, we have a diversity when it comes to um, income as well from uh, some of the wealthiest along the North Lake Front um, to some of the communities that um, are in, uh, represent people who are in need. Um, and it is just a privilege, such a privilege to be able to represent this district. And I want to thank the Ismaili community. I've been very close to that community for a long time. In fact, I think I've been at every one of the um, partnership walks um, since 2002. I may have missed uh, one, or, one or two. Um, and these are events that take place sometimes in the district along Montrose Harbor um, to raise money um, for poverty, to, to end poverty, not only here, but the Ismaili community, which is located in 25 different countries, to address poverty around, around the world. I've been privileged to uh, receive uh, an award, uh, actually a couple of them, um, during those walks that also bring the community together and represent the kind of volunteerism. That's what always has uh, impressed me so much about the Ismaili community, is that it's pretty much run as a volunteer organization with um, members of the community participating in all kinds of different projects um, and, and working um, tirelessly to make our community and make the world a better place. I also had the privilege of um, meeting His Highness the Aga Khan when I was at, invited to an event in Washington, D.C where um, the Ismaili community won an award for architecture. Um, and so cultural issues are also such a great part. One of my most treasured uh, staff people, um, Zara Zomani is a um, member of my team. She's been working for me for 12 years um, doing constituent service and now um, working to get her doctorate in um, educational psychology. I'm so proud of, uh, of Zara, who has also helped me um, integrate as much as I can with the Ismaili community. Um, so I am just thrilled to be here and to have this opportunity. I want to thank you so much uh, for that. And with that, I yield back. All right, Congressman, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. John, thank you very much. Much appreciated. It's good to be here. One correction, I would say I'm a member of the Special Operational Forces. Special Forces is a small piece of the larger Special Operational Forces that Delta, Navy SEALs, Special Forces, uh, Civil Affairs, and PSYOPs fall into. Uh, with that said, uh, a blessing and my regards to Prince Karim Aran for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I wish him uh, a future success. I wish him to be blessed uh, as he continues to grow the Ismaili community. I was born in Iran, uh, as Sean said. Um, I immigrated to the United States. Uh, my family, my friends, I still have individuals that live in Iran, live in the Middle East. Uh, we do understand everything that the Ismaili community has faced throughout its history. And uh, even going back uh, time and tent to what happened when the after the Mongol invasion with all the aspects that uh, the Ismaili community was being hunted and was being massacred. The Assyrian Christians, uh, which I am a member of, uh, went through uh, similar genocides from 2014 to 2017, the most recent one. So uh, I do understand what the community has dealt with overseas and what it tries to accomplish by coming to this country to allow its future generations to develop. And I am very glad to see that it has been able to be prosperous 
uh, across the spectrums. Uh, I am today here, as I was asked um, uh, before, why are you there without a coat on? Because I'm here amongst friends. Uh, I do understand the culture. I do understand the wants and desires. Uh, I do understand the traditions of the Ishmaeli uh, community. And um, I'm hoping that over the course of this uh, question and answer period, that I can alleviate some of the concerns that you may have for your future generations. With that said, uh, again, uh, with uh, God's blessings, uh, let's hope that uh, I'm able to answer those questions that you need. And uh, we hope for a blessed uh, uh, expansion of the Ismaili community uh, programs within the United States and hopefully in the 9th Congressional District in the future. All right, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much for that. With that, we will move on to our question and answer session. Again, each candidate will receive two minutes of uninterrupted time to answer the question. The first question, you already had a preview, is on COVID-19 recovery. With over 200,000 Americans dead as a result of COVID, historic levels of unemployment, and the incoming third wave, the United States does face an unprecedented public health crisis that has hit marginalized communities. What action should Congress take to curtail the spread of coronavirus, and what does a COVID recovery, recovery plan look like to you? Congresswoman, you have two minutes. Well, thank you for that question. Let me begin with a little bit of good news, and that it comes from the Ismaili community. I know that nationwide, the Ismaili community with its mask program has actually made 500,000, maybe it's even more than that by now, um, handmade masks that are then distributed to communities that really need to have them. Over 10,000 right here in, uh, in the Chicago area. Um, and so I'm proud of that. And in addition, has been focusing on the elderly and on telehealth programs um, that are so important in order to, to deal with the issues when people are um, staying at, at home or in institutions. So I thank you for, for that. What we've seen is a complete failure of the federal government to act to stop this um, pandemic. In fact, there's new news today about how um, the United States fares against other countries, which is so very poorly. Um, part of it is that we're getting these um, messages from the president of the United States that it's not really serious, that it is not necessary to social distance or wear masks when the public health protocols are the thing that could really help us. In addition, we've ha seen our frontline workers have shortages of what we call PPE, the protective, uh, the personal protective gear, so that when they walk into the workplace, like nursing home um, workers, that they are fully protected. Um, we have seen a failure to um, to test and to trace um, the uh, those who who have the the, the virus. Um, and, and while all of us hope very soon there will be a, a vaccine that will improve it, in the meantime, what we need are these public health rules that we follow because we are seeing right now a spike in, in states all over the country. We've even seen an increase in Illinois in the cases that we're seeing and the, the deaths. Imagine over 200, I think it's over 215,000 Americans who are dead and millions, millions more who have uh, acquired the, the, the disease. Um, and, and so we need to see some, some leadership. We need to pass a relief bill. People are suffering. People are crying into the telephone, telling us that with the economy down, that they can't pay their rent, afraid their parent, their families. I'm looking to see if I'm out of time. Um, you, you've had two minutes. Uh, oh, okay, I'll stop now. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. Well, uh, look, uh, we talked about federal response, right? So the congresswoman is in the federal government. Uh, she needs to work with her colleagues across the aisle in order to be able to pass a bill. There's 535 members of Congress, 100 sit in the Senate, uh, and the rest sit in the House of Representatives. It is the job of a representative who's representing the ninth congressional district to regardless of what the party politics are and the talking points and the political climate, you have to be, as I said in a talking point to an interview that I did yesterday, 
you need to sometimes prostate yourself in order to be able to get to a point with the other party to get something passed. So really the only thing you can do as a representative in the night is go get those dollars that are very needed and crucial to be able to keep our businesses up and running here in the ninth congressional district and at the same time be able to support the medical needs that are the shortfalls that were caused because uh, under the uh, 22 years you've been in, majority of our manufacturing went to China to include the fact that they held our PPEs and raised the price on them to use them against us. I want to thank the Ishmaeli community for stepping in and doing what the federal government should have been doing at the time, uh, paying money for their pockets, taking money out of their mouths of their children, giving it to the support of these type of uh, programs, which were providing masks, just like I did when we created masks for our first responders, because the equipment that they had were not adequate enough. That is the job of a representative. And I hope that you spend the next 20 plus years, Congresswoman, as a constituent in your district to go out there and finally tell the party leadership there needs to be an agreement between the Republicans and the Democrats and start getting that needed funding directly to us to deal with the health crisis. As far as the virus is concerned itself, it is a virus. There's studies coming out that are saying that even masks uh, in a close study uh, have not had the effects that they should, given the fact that most of our masks are probably coming from China, which are not capable of handling the issues of uh, coronavirus. I have myself worked on getting masks here from Israel, which is a very strong ally for us. And those masks are not being used directly by the Israeli Defense Forces to ensure that their folks are secured. Those items are out there. I hope that the Congresswoman uh, goes out there and spends the time and money to bring Dell's equipment to our district. Much appreciated. All right, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. On to question two now on financial and racial inequities. Currently, we are living through major challenges beyond the health crisis. We have seen economic hardships, which have created widening in inequities between segments of people and racial injustice, resulting in civil disorder. How can we address these challenges? Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. Racial inequality goes away once you have given uh, opportunity, economic opportunity to, every, to everyone. And the economic opportunity cannot come from the government giving you money or being on a stipend form. Take a look at the Ishmaeli community and take a look at what they've been able to do. They've been attacked, they've been uh, marginalized in the countries that they lived in. They came to the United States and were able to finally build themselves in the diaspora, just like my community has done. They have become members of the fabric of this nation. Uh, this nation is the only nation where it says that you can come here and you don't have to forget your traditions. You don't have to forget your language. You don't have to forget how you, your customs were, your religious preferences and how you conducted yourself. And you could hold all those and still be a member of this fabric of the nation that is the United States. And I think all the ethnic communities that we have here, especially with the fact that I've had the Korean community come out and uh, work with me for a coalition build, the Filipino community and the preachers who came out and recently endorsed me, the uh, Indian community with US Impact, with which endorsed my candidacy uh, and all other communities to include my community, which is a Syrian community, the Greek community. These are the ethnic fibers that actually keep this nation whole and progressing in the future. So if you wanna be able to have economic opportunity for everybody, then you have to allow business to function. You have to alleviate the sanctions that you put on them through uh, various different legislation that you push. You have to allow entrepreneurship that is displayed in the Israeli community to be able to link back to a host country or home country, in this case would be Pakistan or other areas of the world in order to be able to have that free flow of commerce without the restrictions that sometimes are being put on it uh, through these requirements. Once you're able to achieve that, then you'll be fine. The other last thing I would say is you have to allow individuals like Colonel Singer, a person of color, to finally be able to be a representative. So you won't have the same representative sit there for 22 years and say that we're gonna have diverse voices in our community. And I hope in the future, the Shmiley community runs their own candidates, both as Republican and Democrats. All right, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. Congressman, you have two minutes. Thank you very much for that question. What the pandemic has really exposed 
in high relief is the fact that we have um, crippling economic inequality, healthcare inequality, housing inequality. And we are seeing right now that the frontline workers, for example, the essential workers, you know what? You don't see a CEO or a, a millionaire or billionaire in the bunch, the people who go to work every day and really in many cases risk their lives in order to take care of people. The people who work in nursing homes, who bag our groceries, who drive our bus, who ride the bus. Those are the people that we're counting on. And yet those are the people who are often the lowest income people. Um, you know, right now we have seen 200, uh, 830,000 women who left the workplace in, in September. Why? Because there is no help for childcare in, in our country right now. Who is getting sickest? We know that people of color disproportionately are getting the coronavirus disease. And we also know that when it comes to um, ra racial justice um, and um, in the um, criminal justice system, who is at the bottom of the list or really at the top of the list that suffers. And yet we see in this country, this is not an accident. Um, the, um, the Republicans and the, the president tout their, uh, their, their tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. And at the same time, we have not seen an increase in the minimum wage at least at the federal level, it's still $7.25. You cannot live on that. It's more, but barely in the state of Illinois to be able to make ends meet. We can end this kind of income inequality. We can allow for more unions to be able to organize. Union workers make more money. We can make sure that tax policy is fair, that we are helping low-income families. And we are the richest country in the world. We can and we must and we will do better. Thank you very much. If you appreciate it. Uh, our next question is on the Illinois Fair Progressive Tax, as it's being called. There is a significant measure on this year's ballot in Illinois on a proposed amendment to change the state's income tax structure from a flat tax to a graduated tax with higher tax rates for those with higher incomes. Do you support this measure and how do you justify your position? Congresswoman Chikowski, you have two minutes. I certainly hope everyone who goes to vote and I hope everyone goes to vote um, one way or another by mail or uh, early voting or in person that you vote. It's at the top of the ballot. It's the number one thing on the ballot to vote for the fair tax. It may not say the fair tax on the um, ballot, but that's what it is. I was in the state legislature from 90 to 98. And even then we were talking about how unfair the tax structure that everybody, regardless of how much money you make, you still pay the same percentage, no graduated income tax like we have at the federal level. And that deprives us of, of money. But who ends up paying more? 97% of Illinoisans will pay the same or less with the fair tax and only people who make more money who will now pay their fair share and add revenue that we'll have to spend in the state of Illinois, revenue that is desperately needed for the programs that serve our people all across the country who make sure that our, our, our roads are built, that our first responders are available, that uh, teachers uh, you know, can, can be paid. So this is a very, very important, important opportunity for us to end what has been one of the nation's most unfair taxes. Um, I remember there was a dirty dozen that they used to, an organization used to put out of unfair taxes. And in Illinois was on that list year after year because it's a flat tax. So please, if you want to 
um, not see your taxes go up. There's a lot of lies going out and about there. I just want to warn seniors. Sometimes they're telling you that they're going to take away, they're, they're going to they're going to tax your um, retirement benefits. That's just not true. It is just not true. So for seniors, for everyone, vote for the fair tax. I very, very much support it. All right, Congressman Schakowsky, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes on the fair tax. Well, they call it that because that's the way you sell it, right? You call it fair tax. It's just basically how you sell the commercial to individuals. You sell the sizzle on the steak, not what actually it is and what it tastes like. Uh, it is a, a means by which the current government is trying to get more money because they mismanage the state. There's an imaginary line on a on a, what we call a map. On one side is called Indiana, on the other side is Illinois. If you take a 15 inch step forward, you're gonna be in a state on the ground that has plus revenues using the same type of tax formats that we use here. A little bit of a difference constitutionally, but still the same. So literally they use the same mechanisms that we use here and they're in a surplus. You take a 15 inch step backwards on that line, and you're in a state that is just absolutely a shamble. It is a matter of how you manage. And if you constantly keep on putting one party in place, then that's what happens. Uh, the ninth congressional district has been under one party rule for 75 years. And if Congressman Schakowsky wins again, it will be under that rule for one, that one party for three quarters of a century. And given the fact they're going to redistrict the current districts after 20, uh, 20 census, uh, it is very much possible for the next 100 years, if, if she wins again, that this district will be under the control of a Democratic Party. 100 years for one party to control a particular nine congressional district, and you wonder why we have problems when it comes to our tax issues. The reality is this, my mother's uh, uh, part B uh, went up, her social security stayed down. Why? Because the individuals that are currently managing the district because they're trying to give money to special requirements and interest to that little echo chamber that constantly churns out the votes for them to keep them in power. They have to raid your social security to take that money and give it to them. That's one thing that they're not able to do. They haven't been able to force a current uh, government that we have to be able to pour that money back into uh, Illinois. So what they're trying to do now, they're trying to get you to say yes on what they call a fair tax, which is to try to go after each of those dollars from the various different individuals in the state to be able to turn around and pay their special interests again. I would vote no in order to be able to force these individuals to do their job. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. Our next question is on small business. Many small business owners have found themselves in difficult times because of the pandemic to stay successful and financially secure. What role should Congress play in supporting small businesses that are struggling? Lieutenant Colonel, we'll begin with you. You have two minutes. Well, look, uh, um, first is you get to uh, elect individuals who understand small business. The current congresswoman will be in for 22 years if she gets elected again, or I should say not, uh, 24 years if she gets elected again, because it's going to be 22 years this November. Uh, when the mayor of Lincolnwood comes to my house, sits with me and says, you know what, um, I, I, we need your support. I'm not here just by myself. I'm here talking about the requirements that we need money from the federal side here. And in those 22 years, that money has not come down because your legislator, individual that's supposed to represent you is not doing their job, then that's an issue. So first you gotta change the climate. You gotta put people who understand small business. When I have individuals come to me and say, Emmonston businesses are being hurt. And uh, that's the actual city there that the current sitting congresswoman actually resides in. Uh, then you got problems. Uh, that means that somehow over 22 years, these businesses have not received the federal support or alleviate the pressures of them that they need. I made the uh, uh, I, I made the promise that if not on a quarterly base, uh, monthly basis, at least quarterly, I will sit with all these community leaders, these small businesses, to include Ishmaeli businesses, and say, what can I do to alleviate those pressures off of you? from the federal side, and I will take all those to the 
federal government to Washington and try to alleviate those pressures to allow those small businesses to work, whether it be linking the Indian community with uh, India in order to, as one of our allies, to be able to get those entrepreneurial businesses to work together, whether it be for us to work with South Korea to be able to get those uh, small businesses up and running again, that is a job of what a representative should do. If you don't have the free flow of that money with these entrepreneurial businesses, all you're gonna do is tax them on their current tax laws and are gonna go ahead and try to put more restrictions on them, then you will never be able to recover when it comes to these small businesses. And for another pandemic hits and you're gonna lock them down and call them non-essential because uh, you have an agenda of how you want to control the people, then guess what happens? You're going to end up losing a lot of these businesses will never recover. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. Congressman Schakowsky, you have two minutes on small business. Well, we know exactly what to do. The Democrats have been since March trying to push a relief bill that would focus a lot on the small businesses. We passed that same bill, the HEROES Act, um, again, um, just a couple of weeks ago, in order to bring money um, to our small businesses. Um, we have um, billions of dollars um, that are designated for the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, and making sure that it doesn't just go to the big businesses who in the first round um, um, were able to get most of that money, but to make sure that it goes to the small businesses that are um, unfortunately, too many of them are shutting their doors and too many of those will stay closed. So we understand the suffering that's out there, the phone calls that come in every single day that we are pushing, pushing, pushing. Anybody who watches the news knows that um, our, our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, to this minute is trying to negotiate a plan that is actually going to make sure that we have the, the help that, uh, that small businesses need um, and including um, restaurants, um, people who work in the airline industry, the, the workers that they that they don't lose their jobs and their and their livelihood. I want to tell you, I get calls way too often from people who are weeping into the telephone, adults, men who say, you know, I can't pay the the, the rent and I'm afraid that my family is going to be out on the street, or women who say, I have to tell you the truth, I can't put food on the table. That is what's happening in the economy right now. And it is Mitch McConnell. And, and the erratic um, President Obama, who one day says, no, we're not going to negotiate. The next day says, um, you know, we're, we're going to make it bigger and better. Um, so we are um, endlessly, and we're not going to stop fighting to make sure that we can save the small businesses in this country. And the first thing we should do is ha we have to get this this pandemic under control so that people can actually go out and shop, that they can go to restaurants and do it safely. And that isn't happening either because we're not gonna have an economy that works for everyone, including small businesses, unless we do something about this pandemic, which hasn't been done. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I do want to make sure that if you wanna make a clarification, you said President Obama. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, did. did I mean Trump or did I mean Biden? All right. I, I believe it, it, you you meant it in the context of the current office holders. So okay. Trump. Sorry, Thank you. Mark, I appreciate it. Correction. We'll move on to health care now. Many voters concerned about the cost of health care. Data shows that voters continue to rank the cost of health care as one of their top issues. Some are looking for more choices, while others find out-of-pocket costs to simply be too high. Meanwhile, small business owners are concerned about how health care reform will impact their bottom line. How do you plan to make health insurance more accessible and more affordable? Congresswoman Chikowski, you begin with two minutes. Okay, there are, there are um, a couple of issues. One is the cost of prescription drugs. Um, we see big pharma exploiting people all the time, people who end up saying, I just can't even fill this prescription or I'll just take half. We can do that by allowing negotiations with the pharmaceutical companies um, over these prices, just like the VA does right now. Um, and that is a very important piece. Um, the, the other is, this is the richest country in the world. And yet 
we don't have accessible, affordable health care for every single person. That's what we our aim is to make sure that health care is a right and not a privilege that goes mainly to the um, to to the to the wealthy. Um, I, I see um, my uh, candidate for president, Joe Biden, is um, talking about it, not just um, uh, saving the Affordable Care Act, which, of course, President Trump right now is trying to overturn entirely. That's part of what this uh, debate is about, of, of their packing the court um, so that they can um, overturn the um, uh, Affordable Care Act, which protects people right now with pre-existing conditions, that would end. But beyond that, he says, we should have, yes, another choice, a public option, a public plan that people can choose in addition to the um, private plans that, that are out there and making um, uh, the healthcare plans much more affordable. We can do this. We can afford to do this. Actually, we can't afford not we can't afford not to do this for for Americans. And so this is going to be at the top of the agenda when we have a new administration and stop those people who have voted 60 times to repeal the act and are still at it right now. All right, Congresswoman, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. Actually, Congresswoman, it's 70 times, so uh, I'll even uh, give you 10 more points on that. But here is uh, at the heart of it. He, he, Sean asked about health care, and you talk about packing the courts. Uh, the reason we are where we are, because you come from a, a socialist far left group of individuals that think that government needs to control everything. And that's what your agenda has been. Even the Daily Herald, if the Shmeli community wants to read about it, did not even do an endorsement of you. And if you take a look at the Tribune, they say that your policies are not even their policy. So there's a lot of individuals in your district, whether it be the uh, U.S. Impact the Indian community that endorsed me saying that you you do not represent them, whether it be the, uh, the uh, Daily Herald that says you do not represent their readers, whether it be the Tribune that says you're, you do not represent their policies. These are what you call those, uh, you know, steps in the snow uh, that uh, indicates who you are. It is that socialist ideology that is a lot of where we are. I am in government healthcare. It's called a VA. I tried to get one skin tag removed and a skin tag that I was trying to remove that was growing into my eye took seven months, seven months to get a skin tag removed. Uh, this is what government healthcare is overall. Now, I am not a fan of ACA. I was never a fan of it, but the constituents in my district, the ones that are on the very low income like it. So guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna defend it. The ones who are rich, have a lot of money, they could care less, they just throw cash at it. Whereas being squeezed is that middle class. Now, from what has been said, and the fact is that ACA is going to come up for a possible discussion on certain eaches of it on 10 November. But that doesn't mean that it's going to go away. That is, doesn't mean that it's going to collapse. My recommendation is if you want to have something that works for everybody, the people who can't afford it, put them in what is a public health care system just like a VA is. The ones who can afford them, let them have a private healthcare system. You don't need to squish them all and put that in the hands of the current representative to be able to manage. It could be done where you have a mixture of the private pu public sector. Before ACA, people could walk into our emergency room and they would get healthcare provided to them. Even today, they would get that healthcare. So the healthcare has always been available. It's how we manage them has been an issue and far left socialists want to manage your health care. That's why they talk about packing courts, as the current congresswoman talked about. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. Our next question uh, revolves around Social Security. Do you believe Social Security and Medicare need to be reformed to close the deficit it is set to face? And do you support legislation that will expand the benefits of Social Security and Medicare? For two minutes now, we will go to Lieutenant Colonel. Look, uh, Social Security is viable if you're managing it. It, it used to be under the Department of uh, Welfare, uh, Social Security Welfare used to be all in one department being managed. When you separated the two, it gave the opportunity for people who want to rate it, like the current incumbent, to rate it and use it for other needs and other uses. So what happens is, like I said, my mom's medic, 
care part b goes up her social security stays down be able to raid that money out of social security to give it to individuals who do not pay into our systems whatever you want to call them they are not part of the fabric of the of the united states they are not the contributing factor of being able to pay into that social security i'll give an example my own mother-in-law and this probably a lot of ishmaeli communities have gone through my mother-in-law came here she couldn't speak any language she was legally blind in her eye she she has both eyes are literally removed one she lost because uh she lost it when uh, uh when uh, radical islamists were trying to shoot up a market in lebanon and a shrapnel took out her eye the other one got infected while she was here and was removed that woman has never worked physically to put money into social security but money has come to her now those are the issues that yes we need to be able to protect those individuals like my mother-in-law but when you have millions of individuals who come to this country are not part of the fabric of the nation that do not work and you, all you do is rate the money out give it to them so that you could get votes every two years to stay in power that's not going to help you want to manage it put it all under a departmental manage and then start working on the issues of addressing other issues differently than just raiding the social security putting money in pockets of individuals who are not going to be able to be successful in the long run working within our system all right lieutenant colonel thank you very much congressman jan Schakowsky. uh the future of social security you have two minutes I'm looking forward to that, but I have to correct one thing. You know that um, neither of us was endorsed by the uh, the Daily Herald. Someone too far left, and so from for them, and too far right, um, which is my uh, opponent. And the Tribune actually endorsed me, um, and you act as if they did not. Um, I am the founder and uh, co-chair of the Democratic Task Force on Aging and Families. Senior citizens has always been my priority. In fact, I was head of the Illinois State Council of Senior Citizens for several years, five years before I ever ran for office. Social Security and Medicare are the bedrock, the most precious programs that we have beloved by all Americans. And Social Security could do even better. We have a plan to add eyeglasses and dental work and hearing aids um, to Medicare. We can make Medicare better and we can make Social Security better and raise that bottom benefit and actually help women who have been out of the workforce for many years to um, get credit for the work that they've done at home. We can do all these things. Um, that Social Security passed at the time of the Great Depression. If we could do it then, we could certainly do it now. And the best way to fund Social Security is to raise the cap. Um, and so more people pay with more money pay into Social Security. And there would be plenty of money to keep it solvent for a very, very long time. So I look forward to making both Social Security and Medicare better when the Democrats take over um, the, uh, the the Congress and the uh, and, and the White House, and really work with our our seniors um, to make life better and easier, and make these wonderful programs, these earned benefits, people have paid for them, to make them better than they've ever been. Thank All right, you. Congresswoman, thank you very much. Our next topic revolves around immigration. What parts of the current immigration system need to be addressed most urgently? How would you address it and what impact would it have to the people in the Illinois 9th District? Congresswoman Chikowski, we'll begin with you. You have two minutes. Oh, the 9th District is deeply affected by this. What we know, for example, is that the number of refugees are being allowed into the United States. We have an international crisis of the most refugee, refugees displaced people ever in the world, built millions of people. And yet the number of people allowed into this great country, uh, my parents, both of them um, were immigrants and came to this country and made a, made a better life. Um, we know that there are 12 million or so people who are undocumented. Many are contributing in every way to our country. We need a way, a path to citizenship for those who are doing, make, con contributing to our country. And what we're seeing right now is an attack 
on immigrants, a demonizing of immigrants, when we know darn well that every generation has been energized by immigrants who come to this country, who are the entrepreneurs my opponent is talking about in many cases. And so we need to make sure that we don't make it harder for them to become full Americans. Finally, I want to say, what have we seen at the border? The separation of children from their parents in a systematic way. We have seen a woman have unwilling surgery to make sure she can't have children in a detention center. The kinds of things that we are seeing now are barbaric and unacceptable. We need to fix the immigration system from top to bottom. We All right. Can do it. Congresswoman, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. Well, again, I'll go back to it again. I'm, I'm going to make a clarification as we did because the congresswoman brought it up, and that's the only reason I'm making a clarification. The Daily Herald did not endorse you, congresswoman. They did not endorse you because you're a far-left socialist in your ideology. In the same way that the uh, Chicago Tribune did not endorse you, say so your politics. Yes, it did. It endorsed you, but in the Middle East, and the Ishmaeli community understands what that is. That's a backhanded type of endorsement. But you, you know, let the people go read it. When when they endorse you and they say your politics are not our politics as an insult, and you've been in for 22 years, that's not a good moment for you, Congresswoman. Now, with that said, let's get on immigration, which is more important than whether or not a paper has endorsed you or not. And the fact that the independent voters of Illinois endorse every Democrat down the list to include Green Party and you were not endorsed, you need to start listening to what the people are telling you, whether it be the uh, individual who's in it running against you right now, who is from your district, and the newspapers and others. You need to get out of your echo chamber and start talking real policy. Let me tell you what real policy and immigration is. I went out and I spoke to a young man who's from the, uh, uh, who's here from France. He came here on an F1 visa, okay? He's here on that F visa in order to be able to uh, become a productive member of our society because our nation and the, uh, and the educational system that you've been in charge of for 22 years is broken, okay? 30% of Americans today have a college degree. Out of the 30% of Americans have a college degree, majority, uh, almost a quarter, por uh, quarter of that uh, number has a, maybe a community college degree. OK, so when you make changes on immigration issues and by the way, Congress is the one that sets the visa requirements, the executive branch executes them through the State Department. So you are the reason why the current laws on the books that are being executed. I do understand there's an executive order out there and I have even been uh, critical of that executive order because I can be critical of my own party leadership where you cannot be. Lieutenant Colonel, said, your time. Uh, I do not see the timeline here, so I apologize. But let right. me finish. Okay. you want to fix that issue is very simple. You need to be able to allow capabilities in this country rewriting our educational policies to be able to have that talent here. You cannot squash it and say we got to hire Americans when Americans do not have the capability of being able to fulfill those jobs and then burden those individuals who are here to be part of our fabric. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. And that will end our Q&A for this forum. Uh, now we will move on to closing statements. We begin with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Well, I want to thank the Ismaili community for inviting us in to speak to you today. This is the most important election in the lives of any American. Nothing could be more important than voting right now. And I just want to encourage everyone to take that opportunity, whether you vote by mail, but do it quickly, um, vote um, at an early voting site, I'm looking forward to that, and, uh, or go to the, the polls and, and do it carefully on election day on November 3rd. Um, I believe that this is an inflection point for the United States of America. I don't think we can afford ten, four more years of Donald Trump. Just our planet itself cannot afford it. We have to do something about climate change. We have to do something about criminal justice. We have to set right our um, healthcare system in this country. We have to make sure that people have jobs and that they can um, get equal pay for equal work if you're a woman. And all the discrimination against immigrants has to end. We have an opportunity to do this as voters. 
And so I just urge you all to take advantage of this most precious right that we have in our democracy. Because right at this moment, lives, livelihoods, and the, and the life of our democracy is at stake. Don't pass up this, this chance for change. And thank you for inviting me. All right, Congresswoman, thank you very much. Uh, now we will have a closing statement from Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sargis Sangari. Lieutenant Colonel, you have two minutes. First of all, I want to thank uh, Prince uh, Shakari Maharan for giving us this opportunity with uh, the members of the Ishmaeli community. Um, it is your leadership that has given uh, the Ishmaeli community an opportunity to be here today and be as uh, vo uh, prosperous as they can be in the United States and um, uh, throughout all the Western nations. Um, the Ishmaeli community is a unique community. It's a community that needs to be, uh, be able to stand alone and be recognized alone and not lumped with every other organization and any other community that is out there. Uh, I was born, as I said, uh, in Iran. I have loved uh, uh, and was educated amongst the Shia communities of Iran. Uh, I have uh, served my nation in combat uh, through all the um, uh, all the operations that we have taken place, uh, to include in Iraq and other Sunni states, I was a member of uh, AFPAC hands, which uh, really looked at what the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan was. My foreign policy uh, understanding of the region is impeccable. Uh, as far as domestic policy is concerned, I, I am a person who has family members that still live uh, in the Middle East region. Uh, in Iran, I have uh, friends, family members uh, that have extended families in uh, Lebanon, in Iraq, and in also Syria. I do understand the struggles that uh, the communities go through. Uh, I have dealt with them on the field of combat. Um, I do know that the Ishmaeli community is a diverse, unique community that should be seen as a diverse, unique community here in the United States as it becomes a part of the fabric of this nation. We have seen what socialist ideology has done to Afghanistan, northern neighbor of Pakistan, ever since the Soviets entered. That concept that led the destruction of the regions, both after the uh, uh, Arab awakening and what has done in Afghanistan, is not trying to filter its way here internally to American politics through far left socialist uh, individuals. In this case, the incumbent I'm running against is seen as that individual from uh, the newspapers to all other individuals and organizations here. I um, uh, was endorsed by the uh, Fraternal Order of Police because they understand I can bring domestic tranquility to the nation. And in that process, working with businesses, small businesses like the Ishmaeli community, we can have a prosperous future for our younger generations. May God bless you all and keep you, and you will have a place at the table when I am in Congress. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude today's forum. I'm Sean Lewis. Thank you very much for joining us, and a big thank you, of course, to the Ismaili uh, Jamat Khanna and Center uh, for hosting today's moderate uh, moderation debate between the ninth congressional candidates uh, in this year's election. We'll send it over to Naveen now for closing statements. Hi, Naveen. Hi, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Congresswoman Chikowski and Candidate Singari for a truly insightful discussion. And thank you, of course, like I said, to moderator, moderator Sean for facilitating the session. Having the opportunity to discuss your timely perspectives on these issues has been extremely valuable. On behalf of the Ismaili Jamaat Khanna and Center, we also want to thank each and every one of our participants that joined virtually from across the United States and abroad. We hope that you found the program to be as valuable as we did. To get more information about the Ismaili Jamaat Khanna and Center, please go to v.ismaili in your web browser. And for more information on upcoming programming, please go to facebook.com slash USA. We look forward to sharing future programming with you. Thank you and good evening.